Chicago Tonight, Black Voices is made possible in part by Fifth Third Bank and by the support of these donors. At Fifth Third, we believe when diverse voices are heard and empowered, communities are made stronger, lives are made better, and the future holds greater promise for all. That's why we're proud to support Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can drive change. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight Black Voices. I'm Brandis Friedman, and thanks for sharing part of your weekend with us. On the show tonight, the city of Chicago writes out another multi-million dollar check to settle a police misconduct lawsuit. How Anjanette Young's case is sparking new conversations about policing in black neighborhoods. One on one with the first black CEO and president of the Metropolitan Planning Council, Darlene Hightower. A look at the thrifty business of vintage shopping in Logan Square. It's been our desire to be a helping hand to the residents of the Inglewood neighborhood. And a West Inglewood food pantry rooted in family tradition. How they're serving up goods and honoring a loved one's legacy. First off tonight, the city of Chicago shells out more money to settle a lawsuit tied to police misconduct. City Council voted unanimously on Wednesday to pay $2.9 million to reserve, resolve a lawsuit brought on by Anjanette Young. Officers left Young handcuffed and naked while they raided her home in February 2019, only to find out later they had the wrong home in the first place. Now, the case and the video of the raid sparked outrage across the country and once again raised concerns and questions about how police handle incidents in black communities. Joining us now to talk about this are Richard Wooten, a retired Chicago police officer and founder of Gathering Point Community Council, and Anthony Driver, a member of the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us. Um, so first, we've got a lot to talk about, obviously, but quickly I want to get reaction from both of you uh, on the settlement that was reached. Uh, Richard Wooten, would you say this was a fair amount? You know, it was a fair amount, but it was not enough uh, to restore what she lost. Okay, and Anthony Driver? Uh, so... I, I think you can't put a price on a person's dignity, um, but I am happy that this is finally resolved and hopeful that reforms will follow. Okay, mm -hmm. so Ms. Young and her attorneys, they're also calling on the city council to, to do a lot more, starting with approving the Anjanette Young ordinance. Now, some of the highlights include a ban on no-knock warrants, requirements that officers wait at least 30 seconds during a knock and announce raid to give residents a chance to open their doors, and a requirement that CPD officers executing home raids do so in the least intrusive way possible. Richard Wooten, back to you. Is that enough, and should no-knock warrants be banned? You know, it's, it is not enough, okay? Uh, it needs to start off from the very beginning. Uh, first and foremost, uh, how can a warrant be issued and who must approve the warrants? Uh, at the same time, you know, uh, these officers who's actually requesting these warrants, they need to do their due diligence and uh, bring proper information to the courts so that the judge can actually legally sign a warrant that is justified. Because the way it's actually going now, you know, an officer can get a search warrant on just about anybody's residency without having, uh, you know, doing any due diligence. Okay. So, uh, Anthony, what's your take on, on the Anjanette Young ordinance and your take on no-knock warrants and whether they should be banned? Yeah, absolutely. So, I, I fully support the uh, Anjanette Young ordinance. I think it is the bare minimum. I don't think they're asking for too much. Um, giving someone notice is the bare minimum that an officer can do before barging in someone's house. Um, we've seen this happen time and time again. I myself have been a victim of a wrongful raid uh, as a young fourth grader, um, and I would love to see these reforms go even further. I would actually love to see the city council unanimously pass this 50 to zero, just as they did the uh, $2.9 million settlement. And just repeating what you just said, it sounds like you were uh, the, the victim of a wrongful raid as a, as a kid, basically, in fourth grade by Chicago police. Yes, um, that is correct. Okay. So the Chicago Police Department, they did make some revisions to their policy uh, for serving search warrants after we all learned about Miss Young's raid, uh, including adding a requirement that bureau chiefs sign off on them um, and that a high-ranking official be on the scene. Anthony, is that enough? 
No, it does absolutely nothing to move the needle. If those uh, policies were in place before the Anjanette Young raid, the Anjanette Young raid likely still happens. Um, we see this happen and, and play out time and time again. It's not enough. Um, also, there's a culture of corruption that must be rooted out. So having the same people who have, in many instances, be be deemed have been deemed uh, corrupt themselves, be the person signing off on these is, is not acceptable. Also, these are policies that are put in place by the Chicago Police Department. Policies change day by day. They can be changed tomorrow by Superintendent Brown. We need this codified into law, which is what many of the aldermen, mainly black women, Alderman Jeanette Taylor, Leslie Harris, and Sophia King, uh, have put this ordinance forth. Also, Alderman Maria Haddon. Um, this needs to be codified into law. It needs to go through the city council, and it, it needs to be made concrete. Richard, what's your reaction? Do any of these measures actually hamper the police's ability to, to fight crime, to do their job? You know, it doesn't actually, uh, you know, hamper their inability to fight crime. What it does, actually, it gives them a more solid base to actually do their job with. The more information we put into the process, the better off it will be for them to actually get, the, get it right the first time. And again, this is all about supervision. This is about holding accountability and not taking this situation for granted. I mean, face it, the city have actually uh, spent over uh, under a half, about a half, under a half billion dollars in misconduct lawsuits. And that's a half a billion dollars of taxpayers' money that we're continuing to flush out because the, the uh, department is not holding individuals accountable, you know, for what they're doing. Richard, are there, are there occasions when a no-knock warrant is necessary? You know what, only if a, a life-threatening situation occurs. Uh, you know, other than that, you know, these basic warrants that, that, that we're hearing about are not life, uh, life-threatening warrants. These are situations where people are looking for guns, drugs, or an offender. And we need to be very careful about actually what type of warrants that we are giving the uh, police uh, the ability to do a no-knock warrant on. Okay. Um, so I want to turn over to, to the raid itself and how that was handled. Um, an investigation by the Civilian Office of Police Accountability, or COPA, found that nearly a dozen officers committed nearly 100 acts of, of misconduct. Richard, back to you. As a former officer, what was it that stuck out to you about the way this was handled? Well, the way this was handled was almost like the good old boys, actually, uh, scenario, where, you know, they have their uh, ability to actually exercise uh, their rights to violate, you know, an individual's, uh, you know, premises. And what we saw during that time was officers haven't had it, haven't had it the way they wanted to without being properly supervised. Now, there was a supervisor on that scene that should have actually stepped up and did what they uh, did what he was supposed to have done. And that didn't happen. So, you know, it was, again, a sign of the good old boys doing what they do best, and that is violates people's rights. Now, Superintendent Brown has asked that uh, the Chicago Police Board fire a sergeant uh, who led the raid. COPA has also recommended that multiple officers be suspended. Um, but it is not always easy to fire a Chicago police officer. Anthony Driver, uh, what do you think could come of this? Yeah, so um, I think they need to be held accountable. I think the officers involved uh, should be fired. I think there needs to be more levels of accountability. Um, to go back to your previous question, one of the things that stuck out to me was not necessarily the actions of them as police officers, but the actions of them as human beings. Uh, what is it about the Chicago Police Department that makes a, a, a regular human being feel like it's okay to burst into someone's home unannounced um, and never actually offer her clothing for nine minutes or so to, to proceed to tear things up in the house? This woman is clearly not a threat. She is unclothed. She's yelling and crying and telling you this is the wrong home and you, you still ignore her. Um, so I think there needs to be more levels of accountability in place. Uh, I'm excited about the new Civilian Police Oversight Board that's supposed to take place in uh, the month of January, and I'm, I'm hopeful that these reforms will actually make a difference. But, you know, can I say this? That further supports the um, mandates for disciplinary and termination because, like you said, Anthony, who in their right mind would actually barge into someone's home and a woman of all, of all, of all people, okay, and maintain her in, a, in, in an indecent exposed situation like that? You know, this is it's, it's unbelievable. And this is not the first time this has happened. I'm quite sure this has happened all over. You know, people are being traumatized for these from these things, and we need to put an end to it. Now, during Wednesday's city council meeting, uh, someone that you just mentioned a little bit ago, Anthony, Alderwoman Maria Haddon, who's also the lead sponsor of the Anjanette Young Ordinance, said that the city needs to do better uh, when it comes to protecting its residents. Here she is. We've just had some discussion about responsibility, about the type of city that we want to be. Um, 
that's been a, a lot of what we've talked about actually over this, this entire week. And moving forward, we're responsible for so many of the reforms and changes that we wanna see. We have a lot of bad things that happen. Some things that are illegal, we've got people though within our charge in our city that, are, that we're also responsible for. Employees of our city, whether they be in the police department or in other departments, that we're responsible for. It's our job to make sure that we're raising the standard, that we're encouraging, urging, and pushing ourselves and our city to be better. Now, Anthony, we've got just about 20 seconds here, uh, but you know, what kind of cultural changes do you think need to happen within the police department to keep these from happening again? What, what needs to happen is accountability. Alderman, I mean, sorry, not aldermen, police officers who step outside of the bounds need to be fired. They need to be held accountable. They need to face the same justice that us on the street have to face. Um, I think once there's mechanisms of accountability, true accountability that's decentralized and not focused on one person who is the mayor of, the, of Chicago. Once that happens, I think that we can begin to change the culture in CPD um, and have them be truly accountable to the people of Chicago. That's what I believe needs to happen. True civilian oversight of the Chicago Police Department. Okay, that's where we'll have to leave it. Richard Wooten and Anthony Driver, thanks to you both for joining us. Thank you. And up next, how the new CEO of the Metropolitan Planning Council is making history. Stay with us. The Metropolitan Planning Council just hired its first black president and CEO. The nonprofit, which began in 1934, is an independent planning and policy organization that seeks to build a more sustainable and equitable Chicago. And the nonprofit's new CEO joins us now. Welcome to Chicago Tonight, Black Voices. Darlene Hightower, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And congrats on the new position. What attracted you to this role? You know, I was really attracted to the mission of the organization, like this idea of creating a more equitable and prosperous region where everybody thrives. Like that's like a, a personal mission for me. And so that's what attracted, to, attracted me to the job. And, um, you know, I've spent the last five years of my career really um, using hospital resources to invest them in West Side communities so that they could thrive. Um, and be economically viable, but now it's time to do that work on a larger scale and do it from a systems and policy perspective and really try to have bigger impact uh, in the Chicago land region. And that's right, you come from Rush University Medical Center where you served there as the Vice President of Community Health Equity. Um, how do you think that experience will contribute to the work that you'll do going forward at MPC? That is a wonderful question because people are always like, wait a minute, you're in healthcare, but um, as a part of my role, we look at the social factors that impact health. So we're looking at, you know, the built environment of neighborhoods and are they walkable? Are they safe? What is the uh, level of community economic development that's happening in these neighborhoods? And these are um, issues that lend themselves to the role at NPC. And so you start in January. I know it's early because you've got a few weeks before you start, but what would you say are your, your first priorities once you get in? You know, my job is to come in and to listen, you know, listen to the staff, listen to the board and our stakeholders, get an understanding of what they see as the important and priorities, um, get an understanding of the organization overall, and then start doing some strategic thinking and strategic planning. What is next for MPC? Um, what is it that we think is going to be the most impactful work that we can do as an organization to have the biggest impact on the Chicago land region? And of course, you know, MPC focuses on, you know, a lot of different areas, affordable housing and economic equity, all of that. Um, are there any particular issues that are on your radar that you want to be sure you turn your attention to? You know, I think, you know, there are several, like when we talk about affordable housing, that's something that's critically important. Stable housing impacts family wealth. It impacts how a community thrives. So that's, you know, definitely important. And then this idea of economic development is important too. What do our neighborhoods look like? How are we investing in them? What kind of projects are happening in them to make them have the kind of economic vitality that we wanna see? So I think those two things. And then the last thing I'll mention is we 
um, will be participating in the We Will Chicago plan, which is the first citywide plan that we've had in the last 50 years. And that is super exciting to me. The staff is already you know, at the table and has been at the table for that work. And it's a real opportunity for MPC to put its stamp on you know, what will hopefully be uh, an amazing and impactful plan for the city. And of course, your role at Rush, it was important, you know, because of the impact that this pandemic has had, um, especially on black and Latino communities. How do you see, uh, you know, the impact of the pandemic on those communities, on your work going forward, on your future initiatives? Yeah, you know, I really think it's an opportunity for all of us to learn, you know, from COVID, to really take a look at what are the communities that have been hardest hit? Who suffered the most um, when it comes to the pandemic and how can we kind of, you know, reshape the way that we do things, whether it's how we invest um, in these neighborhoods, who we put in leadership positions, what we think is important for communities and people to thrive. This is an opportunity for us to do better. And so, you know, COVID has been a terrible experience for so many of us. What can we take from it and learn from it so that we can do better going forward? So uh, under the Lightfoot administration, uh, the city has really, you know, doubled down recently on some community investment uh, with the Invest Southwest initiative, as well as affordable housing. There was a big uh, investment that was announced uh, over the last couple of weeks, you know, major initiatives that she's gotten some attention for. How would you rate how the city is performing in some of those areas that are also overlapping with MPC? Yeah, I think that those things that you just mentioned are incredibly um, encouraging. I think that they're amazing opportunities for us to get resources into neighborhoods that have been historically left out. So I'm excited about that. I also appreciate that this administration is focused on equity in every sense of the word and, you know, is um, using that as a way to make decisions about where investments take place. So I'm, I am encouraged. Okay, and we've got about 45 seconds left, but you know, what, how do you plan on communicating and working with um, other government agencies uh, around Chicago as well? You know, one of the things that um, I learned and have been, you know, so grateful to learn is that a lot of my friends have already done a lot of work with NPC. And so when this announcement came out, I, you know, got reach outs from folks that have worked with this organization in the past and only have wonderful things to say about it. And so I'm just excited to pick up the mantle and continue to work with people and organizations that MPC has partnered with for a really long time. Okay, Darlene Hightower, I'm sure we'll be seeing you again as you uh, get your feet underneath you at your new position at Metropolitan Planning Council. Best of luck. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. And we're back with more Chicago Tonight Black Voices right after this. Resale is a multi-billion dollar industry, more than $24 billion in 2018, according to the research by the online resale shop ThreadUp. And shopping secondhand is growing in popularity as an affordable and eco-friendly way for young fashionistas to carve out a style niche for themselves. Two shops in Logan Square are hoping they can capitalize on that trend by adding a touch of luxury to the resale experience. Producer Erica Gunderson has this story. When someone comes into Vintage Frills, I want them to look at the pieces and go, wow, this is from 1980, and it's in great shape, and it's made in the USA, and I can afford it. The mass-produced clothing known as fast fashion is ultra-trendy, accessible, and cheap. But an outsized carbon footprint often hides behind the low price tag of those of-the-moment styles. Logan Square resale shop owner Jennifer Kelly says her store offers an affordable antidote to fast fashion's environmental ills. Vintage is mostly made in the USA, and you look at some of these clothes, they're amazing. As far as sustainability, when you shop vintage, you're kind of saving the planet, to be honest. Uh, when you shop fast fashion, we all know it can go down a dark, crazy road of um, sweatshops, you know, people are just not getting paid, and then it's bad for the environment. Vintage fans say the construction and uniqueness of decades-old clothing beats the pants off fast fashion. It's a step away from fast fashion, a step away from the very common choices that you find in other stores. You get to really dress yourself in a way that is very special to your style. 
A few blocks down Milwaukee Avenue, the owners of El Dorado Thrift Store are also bringing a fresh approach to resale retail. Diane Via Gomez and her family designed El Dorado to look and feel like a fashionable boutique. We look fancy, but we're not expensive. <laughs> but we definitely wanted to create something um, different from the industry. Thrifting has always been kind of uh, looked down upon, frowned upon, and hasn't been like the most fun and clean experience. So historically, El Dorado was a hidden city and it was thought to be completely filled with gold, right? And so that's basically what we wanted to aim for when we opened the thrift shop. We wanted to make it a little hidden nook where people can find gems. And Via Gomez says shoppers seem to appreciate that look and feel as much as the price tags. I started living alone about a year ago. I can't afford like some of these brands straight off the rack. So like I don't feel shame actually going to a thrift store. Rather like I do make my own money now, but I would rather spend like, wisely. Back at Vintage Frills, Jennifer Kelly says she's always looking for items from the 90s and 2000s that she says are on trend with millennials and Gen Z kids. They love like urban streetwear in particular. So I try to scout that out a lot for them. That's right, Gen Xers, your high school outfits are officially considered vintage, but at least they're the real deal. I got real mom jeans. They're worn by real moms, okay? And vintage frills, more history, more quality, not fast fashion. So that's where they need to come and get their mom jeans here. For Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, this is Erica Gunderson. The mom jeans. You can find more on vintage frills and El Dorado on our website. As we celebrate the holidays, many people in need come to rely on local food banks. One food pantry in West Englewood has been around for more than 20 years. It was started by Sam Ella McKenzie, who passed away last year. One of her final wishes was for her 10 children to continue her work and serve people. For tonight's The Last Word, daughter-in-law Pamela McKenzie shares how she and her family are keeping that legacy alive. My name is Pamela McKenzie. I'm the food service coordinator for All Things Through Christ Food Pantry. Our food pantry was started by Samella McKenzie, who is my mother-in-law. In 1998, we began serving food to a few people who would come by the pantry. My mother-in-law had a desire to feed hungry people. All of her children got together with their own money and went and purchased food items from Aldi's. When we first started, all we were distributing was apples, oranges, and a couple of cans of food. And that eventually grew. It's been our desire to be a helping hand to the residents of the Inglewood neighborhood. When we first began serving food, it was a labor of love, but we had minimal items to give or to distribute to our clients. Um, since partnering with the Greater Chicago Food Depository, we've had more items to be able to fill grocery bags so that people have enough food to put on their table for a week. They are able to come in and after they've signed in, they can go into the pantry, shop for whatever they need. It feels more like they're coming into someone's home and that, or going to somewhere and shopping for the things that they need and they get to choose what um, they need for their families instead of us just packing bags of whatever. Some of those items they may not be able to use, but by going in and being able to select on their own, they feel more in control. And that's what we want. We want them to feel comfortable. We want them to feel like they're being helped, but not getting a handout. Anybody that comes into this food pantry we don't just want them to say, here's food and go on your way, but we want them to know that we love them here and that we're here to help if we can, not just to give you food, but encouragement, love, support, or whatever else they may need. This was a love child for my mother-in-law, um, and we love her. We loved her. Her heart was always um, to feed and to help people. Our love for the people of Inglewood is shared by her, and we wanted to make sure that that legacy continued. We didn't want it to die with her. The people that would come here, they knew her as Mother McKenzie. I believe that she would be very proud with what we're doing and our plans to continue her work 
and not just giving people food, but giving people hope, giving people some place to go to be able to receive love and to receive food. The All Things Through Christ Food Pantry is open every Saturday morning from 9 to 11. And that is our show for this weekend. Be sure to check out our website, WTTW.com news for the very latest from WTTW News. And if you're watching us on Saturday night, know that you can also catch Black Voices and Latino Voices on Sundays beginning at 10 p.m. And join Paris Shuts next week at 7 on Chicago Tonight. And a note before we go, we will be taking a break for the holidays next weekend, but please be sure to join us again in the new year on January 1st for a special edition show. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight Black Voices, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us. Happy holidays and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Clifford Law Offices, a personal injury law firm which is proud to honor founder and senior partner Robert A. Clifford and partner Shannon McNulty for their award for excellence in pro bono and public interest service.